if you look at any creative endeavor that human beings engage in, so that would be an endeavor where there's variability in individual production. It doesn't matter what it is. Here's what happens. People compete to produce whatever that is, and almost everybody produces zero. They lose completely. A small minority are a tiny bit successful, and a hyper minority are insanely successful. And so the Pareto distribution, for, and the Pareto distribution is, is the what geometric graph representation of that phenomena. And so here's how it manifests itself. Um, if you have 10,000 people, 100 of them have half the money. So the rule is the square root of the number of people under consideration have half of whatever it is that's under consideration. So this works everywhere. So if you took 100 classical composers, 10 of them produce half the music that's played. And then if you take the, the 10 composers and you take 1,000 of their songs, 30 of those songs, which is the square root of 1,000, roughly speaking, are played 50% of the time. And so there's this underlying natural law, which is... It's expressed as the Matthew principle, which is from a New Testament statement. The statement is, uh, to those who have everything, more will be given. And from those who have nothing, everything will be taken. It's a vicious statement, but it, it's actually, here's one of those places where it's actually empirically true. This happens everywhere. And so what Marx observed was that capital tended to accumulate in the hands of fewer and fewer people. And he said, that's a flaw of the capitalist system. That's wrong. It's not a flaw of the capitalist system. It is a feature of every single system of production that we know of, no matter who set it up and how it operates. I want you to notice how convinced he sounds and looks when he makes the statement about the Pareto distribution, as if he had really researched the matter thoroughly and he had rock solid sources. But in fact, he's completely empirically wrong. And so that highlights a tremendous level of dishonesty. He's basically acting. Now, if we quote a real specialist, a real knowledgeable person on the matter, a real economist who in fact has written the most highly praised book on economics in the last few years, which is Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century, which deals specifically with the issue of inequality, contains mountains of research, his conclusion is that the words Pareto distribution don't mean anything concrete at all and that the defining feature of economic history is not the stability of wealth distribution but rather its changing nature. To quote from the book, so-called Pareto coefficients have varied enormously over time. When we say that a distribution of wealth is a Pareto distribution, we have not really said anything at all. It may be a distribution in which the upper decile receives only slightly more than 20% of total income, as in Scandinavia in 1970 to 1980, or one in which the upper decile receives 50%, as in the United States in 2000 to 2010, or one in which the upper decile owns more than 90% of total wealth, as in France and Britain in 1900 to 1910. In each case, we are dealing with a Pareto distribution, quote-unquote, but the coefficients are quite different. The corresponding social, economic, and political realities are clearly poles apart. Even today, some people imagine, as Pareto did, that the distribution of wealth is rock-stable, as if it were somehow a law of nature, which is precisely what Jordan Peterson said. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. When we study inequality in historical perspective, the important thing to explain is not the stability of the distribution, but the significant changes that occur from time to time. And I may add that Peterson neither mentions the obvious historical role of unions in reducing inequality, nor the fact that primitive society, which features the largest number of people who ever lived and the longest periods of Homo sapiens existence, features not only egalitarian economic outcomes, but also of creative outcomes. In other words, creativity in primitive society was not so much a feature of material 
production because they stayed materially and economically static for hundreds of thousands of years, but rather a feature of their spiritual and ritualistic view of nature. And primitive ritual, uh, to quote social anthropologist Ernest Becker, Pulitzer-winning anthropologist, even the humblest person was a cosmic creator, that is, had a fairly equal share of the creative powers of the community. Here's a paragraph from an excellent book called Escape from Evil. We can only really get inside primitive societies by seeing them as religious priesthoods, with each person having a role to play in the generative rituals. We have so long been stripped of a ritual role to play in creation that we have to force ourselves to try to understand this, to get this into perspective. We don't know what it means to contribute a dance, a chant, or a spell in a community dramatization of the forces of nature, unless we belong to an active religious community. Nor can we feel the immense sense of achievement that follows from such a ritual contribution. The ritualist has done nothing less than enable life to continue. He has contributed to sustaining and renewing the universe. If rituals generate and redistribute life power, then each person is a generator of life. That is how important a person could feel within the ritualist view of nature by occupying a ritual place in a community. Even the humblest person was a cosmic creator.